Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Jamie Bramwell. I am, it's a little bit of an odd talk to start with. I'm less of a kind of numerics researcher, like a lot of you probably are. I'm more a production level uh, code developer. Uh, I work a lot on production level tools here at the lab, uh, but I had kind of a background in high order finite elements. That's how I got involved in the MFEM team. Uh, but my focus is really trying to harness the power of MFEM for uh, practical engineering applications uh, for our engineering analysts here at Lawrence Livermore. Uh, and through this uh, came the open source CIRAC project, which I'll talk a little bit about today. So to get started, a couple of years ago, uh, we had these talks among the engineering directorate here at, at Livermore of we really needed to refresh our simulation codes, our high fidelity simulation codes. Uh, for a variety of reasons, some of which being the new GPU machines, uh, also that there were rapidly new engineering technologies, think additive manufacturing. Also, we wanted new workflows, think machine learning and design optimization that our old um, codes just couldn't handle uh, without a lot of refactoring. So we took a step back and said, okay, let's take, let's take advantage of this opportunity and think about what do we want an engineering code of the future to look like and who would use it? And that's, I'm a big proponent of kind of requirements driven design. So we stepped back and thought who uses these codes or who will use these codes in the future really? Uh, you know, and we kind of had these four buckets. So the first was your typical engineering analyst. This is someone who interacts through an input file or uh, you know, a large analysis workflow to get uh, an answer out of the code, but they have very complex meshes. They care about, you know, they really care about the physical processes being modeled, the constitutive, uh, uh, the constitutive models within the code. That's really what they care about. They don't really care about the discretization. They don't care about the computer science. Uh, they just want to get an answer out of the code. And that's the typical user that we're used to. Uh, however, another user uh, of these simulation softwares you can think of, and it's probably most of the people on this Zoom, Zoom call at this workshop are computational scientists. People who are like, you know, I really wanna develop a better contact algorithm and contact solver, hint, hint, please do that. That's what we need. <laughs> uh, uh, or I wanna do high order finite elements uh, for structural mechanics, people like that. Uh, they wanna interact with these large production codes so they can test out their algorithms on the big problems. Uh, but they don't really so much care as like the nitty gritty of the material models, in general, or like these big analysis workflows. Also, there's the software engineers, you know, those are the people who are consider, concerned with how do we get these codes onto the new machines? How do we keep this code healthy? How do we integrate this code uh, with other software packages? Um, I'm, I'm somewhat in between a software engineer and a computational scientist at this point. So I have a lot of uh, heart in, in that area. And then finally, this is kind of the new thing that came with this new generation of codes is the data scientists and design optimization. And they don't really care so much about how you're solving your forward models or, uh, you know, what, what this complex output is. What they want is a low level data API to get the, the actual simulation data to it injected into a machine learning algorithm or a design optimization algorithm to answer kind of a meta question above that. So the question became, how do we design a code framework which can satisfy all of these communities? And from that uh, came CIRAC, which it's this, we thought of this as a simulation toolkit. So in engineering applications, often we have someone come up with a new additive manufacturing process, uh, a new optimization technique, a new biomedical application, where we might have to do something we're really good at, think structural mechanics plus X, maybe uh, a biomedical model, maybe we need to interact with the new physics, maybe uh, we need to do phase transitions, things like that. So we needed an agile, quick way to modify these codes. And that's what Serac came out of. And so the idea here is we wanna leverage everything we can. And a huge component of that is the discretization engine of MFM. So. We rely heavily on MFEM for our discretizations and with MFEM called all of its dependencies, Hyper uh, and Sundial specifically is what we use a lot of. But we, we're also bringing in a lot of the computer science infrastructure that we develop here at Livermore as well, specifically SPAC to manage our third-party library dependencies, 
BLT, which is a bunch of really nice CMake macros for HPC applications, uh, and the Axum Computer Science Toolkit, which has a whole variety of niceties, such as uh, a great input deck parser or logging streams or a, a kind of data management and restart capabilities. And we put it all in one nice package such that someone like me, if presented with a new application, can come in, build a production level application in, let's say, weeks instead of years. That's really the goal here. Uh, and we've put a, a huge focus on software quality in this project. Typically at the lab, codes start off as research projects and then kind of become production level tools. So this was an experiment in saying, hey, let's use the products of these other research programs and try to develop a production tool from day one. So we use modern C++, we use C++ 17 heavily. Uh, we're really concerned with API design and documentation and uh, trying to make this framework as robust as possible and have it affect a lot of applications. So these are just some simple applications we've done. Uh, we have a, a new capability for implicit mortar contact. Uh, Julian Andre, who's on the phone using this framework, uh, did a nice flow battery simulation. And here's your simple, I think it's MFIM example 15. I'm bad with the numbers, uh, but it's the heat conduction hotspot simulation on the star mesh. But here we can condense that down to just 10 lines of C++ code, which an engineer could understand. And I'll get into that in um, just a little uh, later on in the presentation. Okay, so this is really a two repo project. So engineering at Livermore in general has never been a fan of open source codes. Uh, they, they're very used to proprietary codes. They wanna keep everything in house. However, uh, in seeing the power of open source software and collaboration, they've kind of wanted to get in the game. Uh, so I've been trying to push as much as I can into this open source repo called Serac. And this is all of our computer science infrastructure to do these multi-physics simulations. Uh, we can do nonlinear thermal structural mechanics. I hope to have a plasticity module in there in, the, in about a couple months, uh, J2 for those of you who are interested. In. Um, but the idea is someone could pick up this and then develop their own multi-physics thing using this infrastructure we developed. And then if any of you have collaborator access to our LC systems on site, we have the, the larger project Smith, uh, which Serac is kind of a proxy for. And that has uh, a, a much larger suite of physics options. Like we have this contact mechanics capability. Uh, we have steady state incompressible Navier Stokes with uh, Julian Andre developed, who is also the author of the Navier mini app. We have a lot of electromagnetics applications and we have a, I just added a Hemholtz filter for use with our topology optimization project here as well. So in developing this infrastructure, what it came down to is what do we expect out of a simulation code? And a lot of it came down to this physics object. So I thought we want an engineer who doesn't have a background in finite elements, who doesn't have a background in high performance computing to be able to look at this code, the, the pure code and understand what it's doing. So let's try to make these physics modules. First of all, they're physics aware. You know, MFM is not physics aware. You talk about H1, H curl, H div. These are physics aware. So this is, I am a thermal conduction object. You will set my thermal conductivity. You will set my heat flux boundary conditions. So someone who doesn't understand the discretization can understand what it's doing. And in between these physics modules, it has a common API and data management scheme. So you can kind of plug and play these physics modules like Lego blocks, you can think. You can say, I have a solid mechanics module, which is well-tested. I have a thermal module, which is well-tested. and you know, me being the researcher, I'm gonna combine these Lego blocks using some interesting coupling scheme or uh, adding another physics. And I don't have to reinvent the wheel because it's all in this well-designed interface. Additionally, uh, before this project started, I got pinged a lot to write kind of MFEM mini apps or example codes. Uh, and I saw myself doing a lot of the same things over and over again. So in Serac, we have a lot of convenience wrappers for people on this call uh, who do this, these codes a lot. You know, we have state managers, so you can always do a restart. Uh, I have some nice wrappers for primal and dual vectors to manage like, I think the T to L vector uh, transition back and forth. They're nice wrappers for that. So you always know what view you're looking at. Uh, we use a lot of Lambda based uh, definitions in our code. So we 
you know, there's the lambda based coefficient now, but now we also have a lambda based operator where you just say, this is the lambda which defines my residual, and this is the lambda which defines my gradient, and it wraps it up in a nice MFIM operator. And also, we have a very powerful uh, input file language uh, through the Axum toolkit component. And so, in general, you can view these physics modules as nice wrappers around MFIM examples or mini apps. And they're just written in such a way that you can plug and play them together to make powerful applications. So this is just an example of like what this physics things does. And it, we started from the point of what do we need to define uh, an abstract initial value, uh, initial value problem just, you know, from finite elements. So you have to, you have to set a domain or a mesh, you have to set your material properties, you have to set your sources and your boundary conditions in your initial state. However, if you're an advanced user, you might want to do things like set some basis type or fancy solver options or a fancy time integrator, but those should have reasonable defaults so that someone who doesn't care about it, it can still work. Uh, and so that's how you would set up one of these physics modules. And then when you actually want to run your code, I should mention from the beginning, we're engineering applications. So we assume all of our physics modules are nonlinear and transient. So we always think about this in terms of time steps. So whenever we run a physics module, we think, how do we advance the time step? So, you know, you want to update your loading terms and then you want to tell it, hey, advance your current state, uh, given the parameters I said to you and get that state back uh, with some kind of interpretation capability. And we use MFEM, so it makes sense. This would be a grid function. However, if you're an advanced user, you might want to do things like set a design field or, you know, solve an adjoint problem of this PD, get a sensitivity back. Uh, that was a large reason why we started this project because solving adjoints and getting sensitivities out of production level codes was just kind of a non-starter. So we designed this from the beginning that we know people will want to solve adjoints and get sensitivities. Uh, so with that, uh, I'll, I wanted to show you a quick example, but so I don't have to switch screens too much. I just want to point out one one thing which we're designing right now, which is super exciting that we hope to upstream to MFEM quickly. Uh, and this is, it's like I said, we're, because we're engineering applications, we always consider uh, nonlinearities and transients uh, from day one. So uh, for those of you on this call who have set up uh, MFEM nonlinear forms or uh, transient problems, you know, it can, it's very powerful, but it can take a lot of kind of time to develop the, the proper infrastructure to do your specific problem. And we wanted something where we could just test things out quickly to see if they work. And we're calling this functional. Uh, that name is subject to change. It's surprisingly uh, contentious what we should call this thing, but you know, just, just call it thing X and it might change when it uh, gets upstream to MFM eventually. So what we thought is, let's think about a general residual form uh, of your weak form. And let's try to make the code look as much like this mathematical description as, as possible. Uh, and to do that, what, uh, and I should say, I did not develop this. This was Julie and Andre who's on, on this call and Sam Mish who's on uh, in the engineering director as well. And they've really done some great work on this and I'm super excited about it. Uh, so to do this, what they do is they split the weak form into kind of the source and flux terms. And if you're familiar with the seed Q function notation, that's exactly what this is. So uh, we what we end up doing is we call this functional. And to make all this work, we have to know our spaces at compile time uh, for a variety of reasons. So that's why if you see this standard function signature, you can kind of see it takes in a trial space as an argument and spits back some kind of test space. But then we also need the, uh, the runtime information in the infim based finite element space. Uh, so then you get your, uh, then you just define, this is like your nonlinear form integrator in this little chunk of C++ code. So you can say, okay, it's a Lambda, you get your spatial position and you get this tuple of displacement. And once again, we use C++ 17 heavily. Uh, so it unpacks this tuple into the state and the, the gradient, and then you can calculate, calculate the linearized strain uh, and do you know, your compliance sensor, although this doesn't have to be linear. This could be anything that you come up with. And then you just return 
you know, the part that acts on the, the test function. So that's zero here. We have a special zero type. Uh, and the stress, which acts on the gradient. And this is uh, forward mode AD enabled. It works on the GPUs. Uh, so you can automatically get a gradient operator out and a residual given a current state. And it's, in my opinion, super powerful. So with that, I just want to show you what some of these things actual, actually look like real quick. If I can manage Zoom. OK. There's screen. There we go. Uh, so I will, because of time, and I have a feeling this is what people actually care about, I'll jump to functional. So this is what, uh, first of all, I'm the kind of person that shows code <laughs> in a presentation, uh, but this is what functional looks like. So you have your domain integrator, uh, for example, one. Uh, it takes in your spatial position and your temperature. Uh, it has a, a right-hand side source term. It has your standard diffusion, and it returns a tuple. So if I run this uh, right now, you can see that it, we assume it's nonlinear. And to solve this, I just you know have a standard linear and nonlinear solver. Uh, it converges in one Newton iteration because this thing's linear. However, if I add this arbitrary nonlinearity, you know, I, I'm not defining the gradient. I'm just adding this thing. I'm not writing my own functional. Um, if I build this again, my computer doesn't puke on running Zoom and compiling at the same time. Uh, but basically, what this does is now I have a GPU enabled nonlinear form uh, via auto differentiation in this, this functional data type with just those few lines of code change. If this actually links. <laughs> But anyway, uh, so with that, uh, I will Live show you demo. that this, yeah, th I'm out of time. So <laughs> with that, I will stop and open up to any questions.